We're also going to come with expectant hearts to the Lord's Word. So why don't you grab your Bibles? We're going to preach through a book of the Bible as we love to do. And last year we spent most of the year in the book of Acts in the New Testament. So we're going to go back into the Old Testament to this wonderful little colourful book of Jonah is where we are headed. So would you turn with me to Jonah chapter 1? As you do, I'll pray for us and then we'll launch into what the Lord has for us this morning. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you that you are a God who's not only aware of, but actively involved in the details of our lives, the details of the world around us. Father, we thank you particularly for your word that is able to lead us, to strengthen us, to challenge us, to convict us. And we pray this morning that we come with hearts that are open and receptive, listening ears, that your word would go deep and that it would really accomplish much for the glory of your name, that you'd be honored, that you'd be lifted high, and that as we lift you high and you're lifted high in our midst and our lives, that many would be drawn to know you and love you, King Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Jonah chapter 1. So we find ourselves in this, I think, a wonderful little book. It's a colorful story. At times, it's almost comical, isn't it? The prodigal, prophet, the big fish. And it's interesting to me how we turn some of these stories and accounts into children, sanitized versions, a bit like Noah and the ark. The wonderful pictures you see of a big boat filled with animals. We forget about the destruction of the rest of humankind that happened at the same moment and can be a little bit like the book of Jonah, this almost pretty picture of a whale, forgetting that this man was swallowed by a whale as he ran from the call of God to preach and proclaim the judgment of God upon a foreign wicked empire. It's a raw and real account and yet in the midst of this book, and this is if you like a title for the series, As we head through this book over the next few weeks, we're going to look at mercy, judgment, and the purposes of God. How do the purposes of God play out in the circumstances that we see around us? It's certainly a burning question that I've had repeatedly over the last few years. And all that we see going on, where's the place for God's mercy? What do we do with the judgment of God? And ultimately, how does all of this point towards and reveal his purposes and his outworkings in the affairs of the world around us? Are we ready? We're alive and well to jump into Jonah? Come on, let's do it together. Jonah chapter 1. says this, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa. He found a ship going to Tarshish. And so he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. A repeated phrase there showing us he's not just running from the call of God, is he? He's running from the very presence of the Lord. Have you ever felt like that? Like, I'm just going to get away as far as I can. In fact, the very next scene we find him curled up, in the bottom, the bowels of the boat, in the midst of the ocean, as far as he could possibly get away, not only from this call that he didn't want to fulfill, but from any semblance. I'm just going to, it almost reminds me of those, uh, I don't know if any of your children are like this, but uh, we've had a few at different stages where they've done something really naughty and they think, if I close my eyes, nobody will see me. You had that thing? Like, did you do that? Silence, eyes closed, you can't see me. I can't see you, so you can't see me. I'm, I'm hiding away. That's a little bit like where we find Jonah. Now, we're actually going to pause there in the text this morning. You're probably thinking this is going to be a never-ending series, but I promise we will pick up the pace in future weeks. But what I want to do is kind of lay the foundation of what we're seeing here, a bit of the history that will give us a platform to launch into the text and the rest of this account as we move forward. 
So we have this character called Jonah. Now, Jonah prophesied during the reign of Jeroboam. We know this from 2 Kings 14. There's a reference there if you want to do a bit of history research. And that's around about the years of 793 to 753 BC. At this particular time, Israel was a nation that was materialistic prosperous. So they were prospering in many ways. In fact, the borders had expanded to their greatest extent since the time of Solomon. If you know your history at all, it had been a bit of a bumpy ride since David and Solomon's era, which was the high point. And since then, there have been good kings, there have been bad things. But at this particular point, they were prospering. There was an expansion of the borders, and yet continually God calls the nation, and particularly the king, to account, to repentance. Jeroboam was an evil king in the eyes of the Lord. And we know this from many different contexts, but in particular, the prophets Hosea and Amos, they were contemporaries of Jonah, and they continually called the people back to God's purposes and plans as they wandered away. Hosea 11, Amos 5 are two references there. So there's a great degree of turmoil within the nation of Israel. There's Um, prosperity, but there's immorality, there's oppression of the poor, there's all sorts of things that are going on that are are wicked in the eyes of the Lord. At the same time, some 500 miles to the east, we have the Assyrian Empire that is on the rise. And in fact, God had specifically called Hosea and Amos, not only to call the people back to repentance, but to warn them that he would use, if they didn't turn back to him or allow the Assyrian Empire to invade, that they would be an instrument of his hand of judgment against his people, the people of Israel. So they're calling people to repentance. They're talking about this rising threat of this godless, immoral and barbaric nation, a neighboring nation. So any patriotic Israelite, how do you think they're going to feel about the Assyrian Empire, about the city of Nineveh. I mean, that's not the place that you put on the top of your to-do list in terms of visiting holiday locations. It's not the place you want to go anywhere near. In fact, you could easily suggest that it would have been truly patriotic at that time to have a deep resentment, perhaps even hatred, towards this country. They stood against everything that the Israelites felt that they stood for. They were, in many senses, the enemies. So that's the surrounding context. In the midst of that, we read Jonah 1, verse 1. It says, in the midst of all that's going on in the nation of Israel and the nations around them, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah. It's a good place to begin, isn't it? The word of the Lord. And as we read this account, we'll find not only does this journey and this story and account begin with the word of the Lord, But it also concludes with the word of the Lord. And in fact, all the details within it hinge upon the word of the Lord and God's calling and the mission that he will commission Jonah to be a part of. This is something we tend to overlook, but we need to grab a hold of, increasingly so in our age and our era of opinion, of noise, of this swirl of information. There's so many things that we can grab a hold of. But what we really need, as the Lord emphasizes here in this passage, above all else, is His Word. We need to grab a hold of the Word. What, what is the, the Word of the Lord for us? What is the Lord saying to me personally, to my family, to our church? What, what is the Word of the Lord for us in this season. And we see that God calls people at a young age. If you read a book that I love to read, and t- talking about Old Testament prophetic books, the book of Daniel. As a young man, he'd been uprooted and, and removed from his homeland, placed in a, a foreign godless empire. And God calls him as a young man. We see Abraham. He's nearing 80 years of age. What happens? God grabs a hold of him and calls him and says, Come out to a land that I'll show you and I'll make you a a father of many nations. Not many of us at 80 years of age would be particularly comfortable with being a dad for the first time. The call of God's not always comfortable, is it? It's not always easy, but it is always necessary. And it is what we need to grab a hold of. In fact, 
But my wife and I were uh, talking a little bit about this during our holiday. We've just come back, had some wonderful times in Queensland, and we enjoyed a week um, at a beautiful beach location, and then we were up in uh, the Great Keppel Islands, which is Southern Barrier Reef, just picturesque, beautiful weather, lovely part of the world. We met some good friends, or made some good friends while we were there for the week, and had a few families actually that we were interacting with. This one family in particular, they were about our age, and they were talking to us because they had moved to that part of the world from the UK, don't blame them, um, about 10, 10 years or so prior, and they were raving about it. They said, it's just been the best move for us ever, we love it, and the kids are settled here, they're in a great school, we both found jobs, and just, just mo- the most amazing thing. In fact, I said, you guys should come and join us, like you would love it up here. And to be honest, I was thinking at that stage, we just stayed in, in this, this, this little seaside village, Agnes Waters, which last year won the, the most picturesque but undiscovered uh, tourist beach area in Queensland, in all of Queensland. So it's not undiscovered anymore, everyone knows about it, but just beautiful, this point break, surfing every morning as the, you know, the sun rises over the ocean, the water's warm, the weather's warm, and I think, man, in the natural, I'm already there, right? I'm already there. But we said to them, you know what, for us, absolutely in the natural, there's so many things that are wonderful about this, but for, for us, what's important is, what's the call of God on our life? What's the call of God on your life? And it was funny because they almost looked a little strange. You're like, just say that again? I said, well, the most important thing is, what's God saying to us? Like, what, what is he actually calling us to at the time? Funnily enough, they came the next door uh, the next day and they're like, actually, we've done a bit of research. We've found the perfect jobs for you guys. <laughs> They said, do you think if we just say it a bit mysteriously, like in a bit of a whisper, or the Lord showed this to us in the dream, we awoke, and would that help at all? And, but, but the thing is, that's, that's what matters, doesn't it? Yeah. And every other place we could run, every other ship we could find to sail upon is ultimately an effort in futility if we don't respond to what God is calling us to. It's what it begins with, it's what it ends with, and it's what everything in this story in our lives hinges and centers around. So the word of the Lord comes to Jonah. Now, who is Jonah? And it's fascinating as you read some of the commentaries and the accounts on this book, because there's all sorts of conjecture about, was Jonah a real person? Is this all just some sort of an allegory, a type, a story, or was he indeed a real person? I think... A lot of that can be resolved by a couple of passages. Not only is he mentioned in 2 Kings, but the Lord Jesus himself mentions him in Matthew 12, 38. So just jump over to that just for a moment. And I want to read this particular account because it's not just a passing mention. He says and gives us something that should cause us to pay attention as we read through this book and really reveals what the heart and the mission of Jonah was all about. So... Matthew 12, 38, Jesus is speaking, and it says this, And some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him, being Jesus, saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them and says, Well, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign. No sign will be given to it except for the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up, at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. And he goes on just to get the full context. The Queen of the South will rise up at judgment with the generation and condemn it, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, something greater than Solomon is here. So two interesting realities that I think are important for us as we launch into this book. Number one, it seems very clear that Jesus refers to Jonah as a real person who spent a real three nights, as Jesus did, or as an image of Christ, Jonah's was in the belly of a whale, and he accomplished a real mission, calling people to repentance, as Jesus himself would accomplish a real mission in calling the Gentiles to repentance and to faith that's found in his name. So, as the saying goes, if you have no issue with the words of Christ then you have no issue with the reality that Jonah was a real person. 
if you have issues with the words of Christ, then you have far bigger issues than whether Jonah was a real man or not. So it shows us that Jesus gives great weight to Jonah and his mission. In fact, there's only four of the Old Testament prophets that he mentions and, and quotes from in his ministry. The others being Isaiah, Daniel and Zechariah. The second thing is that it shows us very clearly that Jonah is held up as a type of Christ. It's not just a colourful story, it is that. But there is an element, an aspect to this that should proclaim and point us towards who Jesus is and what Jesus came to accomplish. And we're going to see that and unpack that a little as we go through. So we've seen the word of the Lord. It came to Jonah and this is what the word said. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. So God calls to Jonah and says, go to Nineveh. Now this really is what makes this book so special and so unique. There's other prophets who at times God had called to prophesy not only to his people but against the nations. But this is the only account in the Old Testament where God specifically called his prophet to up and go. To physically relocate, not to send them a letter, not to pen down some thoughts and post it on social media. But to physically relocate and to bring them a message in person from him. And so there's a couple of things here in order for us to really, as I've said, build a foundation that, that we, can, we can work with in future weeks that I think are wonderful about this book and will set us up for where we need to go. Number one is simply this. We see in the, in the midst of this picture, in the midst of God calling Jonah, in the midst of him being aware, not only aware, but sending a prophet to preach to Nineveh, we see, and I'll unpack it, First and foremost, a God who cares. We see a God who cares. Let me explain what I mean there. You see, one of the questions that I think we wrestle through, not only as we read through the scriptures, but in our own day and time, is how does God approach the wickedness that's all about us? How does it, what, what is it that he, he thinks as he looks down and he sees some of the things that happen all around us? Is he removed? Is he unmoved by the wickedness? Is he kind of like, well, I've set it up and, you know, it's over to you guys now. We'll just see what you can do with it. See, there's this wonderful picture here for us to grab, as we see all the way through Scripture, of a God who cares and a God who moves. Now, remember this as I make the point. Don't forget that Jonah was sent not just to proclaim judgment. That wasn't the heart of Christ's mission. To send Jonah to say, well, I just want you to set them up for a fall. I want you to proclaim that I'm against them and judgment's coming. And as he did and he was hoping for, then sit back on the mountain and just watch my wrath being poured out upon him. But the whole purpose of his mission was to send Jonah to preach to them so that they might repent and so that he might show mercy. And I'm getting ahead of myself, but that's exactly what Jonah's complaint is to the Lord. He says, see, I told you this was going to happen. This is the whole reason I didn't want to go, is I knew that I was going to preach and they were going to repent and there would be mercy and I don't get to watch, you know, the apocalypse now and judge. I mean, I knew it was going to happen. I knew you were a merciful God. I knew that there was going to be a relenting of this. You're too nice. And they don't deserve that. They deserve something far different from what I knew that you were going to show to them. And of course, again, the book will end as we get to it with the Lord saying, the problem is not that I care, the problem is that you don't. You care more about the temporary shade of a little plant that was keeping you sheltered from a harsh wind than you do about the fate of an entire nation that I've had mercy upon because they don't even know their right from their left. I've had compassion and mercy and a love for these people because they're hopelessly and helplessly lost. You see, so much of the Old Testament and the New Testament is devoted to this God who loves and cares for his people, right? His covenantal people. It's all about how God reveals and unfolds his heart of love towards us, the people that he's chosen and called and redeemed by the power of his name. But this gives us another insight into the love and the mercy of God. 
because he shows mercy and compassion in this story and account as he calls Jonah to go, not on his people, his covenant people, but on a godless, wicked empire. And let me ask you this question. What was it that attracted God to Nineveh? Does it say in here, they've arisen before me because, well, they're bad, but they're, they're making some efforts to clean themselves up. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a few things that I've seen that kind of warrant them and make them worthy of my attention. Doesn't say that at all, does it? Does it say, well, well, they're really evil, well, they seem evil, but really at, at, at the base of, you know, if you, if you peel back the layers, there's, there's something good and worthy, there's, there's something that I've seen in them beyond the surface that makes them worthy of my attention and affection. In fact, the exact opposite is true. What attracted God to them was not that they were less bad, but was that he is a God who picks the worst and loves nothing more than for his strength to be made perfect in the midst of our weakness. Did they deserve his mercy? No. And that's the point that God will make to Jonah, and neither did you. And yet that's who I am, and that's what I extend is mercy when it is Least deserves. Least deserved. The wonderful reality about this for us too, just think about this, is that there is nothing. There's nothing in our lives. There's nothing in the world that we see around us as confusing, as complicated, as heart-wrenchingly disappointing as we see with wars and oppression and injustice. There is nothing that is beyond his realm and reach. To rescue, to redeem, to reconcile. And that's what, that's what he's all about. That's the heart of his kingdom. It's not to come down to the strong, is it? Give them a tick and a pat on the box. You guys are doing well and keep doing what you're doing and the rest. You're just worthy of judgment. And this is a gospel and a Bible that proclaims the God of glory, the God of heavens, who comes down to get dirty in the dust. With, with the least of the least. To love them and to lift them out of the ashes. So there's nothing beyond his mercy. He is the God who calls us, who cares. And the second part of it is for us this morning. He is the God who calls. Not only does he care, but he calls us as his people to care. To care about what moves his heart. Think about this, he could have selected any method if, if he was really moved by Nineveh, if he really wanted to, to pour out his mercy. I mean, there could have been any other method and model, couldn't there? He could have given them dreams and visions. He could have sent a talking donkey. He could have written something in the heavens. And this, I mean, there's, there's many other methods. And yet this is what he does. Is he says, I'm going to rise, uh, I'm going to raise up Jonah. I'm going to call someone who definitely doesn't want to do that. I'm going to do a work in his heart so that not only can I show that I'm a God who cares, but that I'm a God who calls those who would follow me to care about the things that are on my heart. And so the story becomes not just about what God's going to do in the nation, but what God is going to do in the heart of his prophet. And I pray in our hearts what he wants to do in us so that he can accomplish all that he desires to do through us. In the same way that he's not removed and unmoved, he calls us as a people not to be passive, not, not to be relegating our responsibility, but purposefully called in to his heartbeat. This is where I want to kind of land and finish and, as I said, set the scene for coming weeks. Because there is this... Repeated question that I often get asked as people have wrestled the last few years through you know, the various things that we've come across. Like, where is God in the midst of what we see? Where is God? And I think as we see where he is, then it does inspire us and it propels us forward into being a part of where he is. How do we find what it is that he's doing and accomplishing in the world around us. So it's, is he a God? I've, I've been asked this question. Is he a God who doesn't care? Like, as he just kind of said, well, you know, it's 2,000 years later now and, you know, it's kind of far enough gone that you should know better and I'm just going to take a back seat. I'm not, I'm not really interested in kind of getting 
involved in the affairs of humanity anymore. I'm just going to let things run. Is he a God who doesn't care? Is he, is he unwilling? Or the other side of the same coin, that's another common question, is, is this all the judgment of God? Like, is, is everything that we've seen, is this part of God's wrath? It's the unfolding of end times, eschatology, get ready, the horsemen are on the way, and it's, the world's just going to fall apart. Like, what is it? Is it somewhere in the middle? And I want to wrestle through some of those things as we go through this little book. But for our purposes this morning, I want us to grab this as the foundation for what we will look at and work through. See, Jonah's default was to run and it was to resist. It was to look for restitution, to look for some way that he could oppose what he believed were an evil people not getting their just deserts. Jonah's default was to look to run and to resist. Whereas God's default, as it always is, is to look for redemption. That's who he is. He is a redemptive God. The gospel at its core, at its heart, is redemptive. It's a story of redemption. It's a story of this God who breaks in, who brings hope and life and mercy and compassion to those who deserve at least and recognize that they could never earn what it is that he brings and offers to them. See, there is this heart of the gospel that is always redemptive. And here's where we're going to end up. And I know I'm stealing the thunder a little bit. It's a bit hard to set the scene without actually delving into what we're going to find as we read through the story. But here's where we end up. And acknowledging they were stealing the thunder, Jonah will see an incredible mass repentance of a city. I mean, surely this is what he, he is a, a prophet of God has longed for. This is the day that he prayed that he would proclaim and that people would respond. There'd be mass repentance. He probably hoped he'd see it in his own nation rather than in a foreign nation. But he's seen that. He's seen God move incredi- incredibly. He's seen God spare and save his own life. And yet where do we find him? Sitting on a little hill and unable to see past his anger and his rage and his hatred. He's so consumed and blinded by that which is immediately in front of him. And this little book is about God calling a people to lift off the blinkers. To lay down our pride and to recognize what it is that we can and must carry in the midst of this season. He says to Jonah, is is your anger, is your hatred, is it it really doing well for you? It's like a counseling session. Is it really serving you well? Like, how's that going for you? He says, it's going great, thanks. I'm going to hang on to this. This is fantastic. And it's left with an open question. What is it that you're going to carry? Are you really going to carry in this world? I know there's stuff going on. Anger, rage, hatred, bitterness. Or are you going to carry hope? That is our call. Remember as Jesus came, he said this. I get the worship team to come back or Ali, someone. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me. To proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to captives and recovering of sight to the blind. To set those who are at liberty, set free those who are at liberty, release the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. You know what you don't find in there? There's no bitterness. There's no hopelessness. There's no hate. There's just glorious, undeniable, unstoppable, unquenchable hope. It's the heart of this incredible book and it's the heart for us. If we're truly going to grab a hold of what God's calling us to now, we've got to be able to take off the blinkers, the blinkers that blind us. We've got to be able to get over the the pride and the stuff that just keeps us in bondage here. What do we look for when we... Look at the world around us. Is there moments for resistance? You know, I've been watching, as I'm sure you guys have, the, you couldn't miss it if you tried, the election campaign. 
And something that's kind of grieved my heart is increasingly how many of these politicians are just accosted in pubs and by the side of the road and death threats. And it's like we've perpetuated this society of resistance that holds people up only as far as we can tear them apart and pull them down. When have you ever seen someone come up to the, the Prime Minister or a Member of Parliament, regardless of whether you agree with all of those views, and, you know, get in their face and grab a hold of them and say, you know what, it's been a really tough couple of years. Like, you've navigated the country through pandemics and I don't agree with all your policies, but I just want to say thank you. Like, thank you for what you've done. I honour you as the Prime Minister, as a Member of Like, thank you. I appreciate you. I want you to know that I'm praying for you. You see, there's... There's this perpetuating cycle of just resistance that's blinded us in the church and in the kingdom to the purposes and the plans of God. It has. I really think it has. We're we're on this cycle of, well, who are we resisting? Who are we fighting against? What's the next battle we're fighting against this issue? And I'm not saying there is times where we have to make a stand. There absolutely is where the Bible speaks clearly on morality and sexuality and the purposes, the the good intention of God. And there is line in the sand, but we have to make a stand. But the mission of the gospel is not resistance. It's not we run and we resist and we're... The mission of the gospel is redemption. It's this God who looks down and finds the most wicked empire apart and said, there it is. That's the moment for my mercy. That's the moment for my redemption. That's the moment for my rescue and reconciliation. And so as we look at the world, particularly as we look at people who don't hold our views, people who hold anything but a biblical worldview, what's our first response? Here's a moment to justify my position. If anyone had the right to come and justify his position, it was the saviour of the world. He could have come down and said, well, let me tell you, you know, you guys are really messed up. I can sit on my high horse here. I can tell you until I return again. Just how miserable and messed up you guys are. He didn't come as the great justifier. He came as the great saviour. And he was the God. You know, I was um, just in my personal time over Easter. There's a little um, film clip that I was watching that had some of the images of the passion. You know that movie, Mel Gibson. I can only... I can only handle it in small doses. I can, like, it just so impacting, but in, in a good way. And it was music played to some of these scenes. And then you know, the, the scene of Christ in the midst of his humiliation. and He's being whipped and beaten. And he looks out. And, of course, in the, in the movie, he looks at some of these people that have so badly wronged him. The very ones that have spat in his face. And he says, Father... Forgive them. What kind of a saviour is that? What kind of a gospel is that? Let me tell you, that's the gospel that we need to rediscover. That's the mercy that we need to grab a hold of. That's what the world needs. To hear and to know and to experience and encounter in our lives. We pray. So, Father, we just thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you that you never give up on us. And, Lord, I pray that even in this moment as we bring this time to a conclusion, as we reflect, I pray, against this wonderful God who redeems. Lord, we ask you through the power of the Spirit, of your Spirit, would you examine our hearts? Lord, that where there is hardened hearts, where there's some of us, put myself in here, who love to be up on our high horses, pontification, justification, resistance, even at times running in rebellion because of our own pride and our own need to be right. Father, we look around us and I, I tell you, my heart is so moved by the urgent need. The urgent need practically, yes, but more than anything, the lostness. Lord, as as you looked at Nineveh and you said, have mercy on it because they don't know they're right from the left. Father, what what, what a society. We we don't seem to know the up from the down. Not even sure what the right way up is anymore. 
But Lord, we thank you that you're not removed and distant from the issues that are all around us. Lord, that you care and that you're calling us to care. And I pray that this would be a moment, a few weeks series as we read through this account of Jonah, of you really doing a work in our heart, that you would recalibrate our hearts, our vision, our perspective, until they beat with your burning passion and desire, until we see things the way you see things, until the world can see the glory of your grace revealed in our hearts and our lives. I ask that in your wonderful name, King Jesus. King Jesus.